I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Why, why, why? Well, the last 24 hours have been rather interesting, with what can only really be described as a complete meltdown displayed on social media by those that don't agree with or even accept the outcome of the US presidential election, with Donald Trump winning what can only really be objectively described as an incredible comeback to the White House for a second presidential term, non-sequential for the first time in well over 100 years. But I do think that Piers Morgan has the answer as to why that is. Many people may agree, may disagree, but you can let me know what you think in the comments. But first of all, if you're new to me, I'm Daniel Shensmith. I'm a barrister of England and Wales. And for the last four years or so, I've enjoyed bringing you legal content and news and recently some political discussions here on YouTube and other media. I'm over on X as well. Do hop over there and follow me there as well. But let's get into what I think is uh, really on the money from Piers Morgan here. Let's take a look at what he said uh, in this short clip here, and then I'm going to discuss what impact this might have for the UK. Let's take a listen to this first of all. Piers Morgan. Primarily because Americans went, hang on, the Democrats are the party of women's rights. So how are they allowing transgender athletes to destroy women's rights in sport to fairness and equality? You can't be both. One erodes women's rights and one protects them. So I think there were lots of inconsistencies there in the way the Democrats presented themselves. It has been a culture war argument that the right has taken on for quite some time. Sure. We know Do you want to answer that specific point, though, from Piers Morgan? About transgender rights? Yeah, and how, that, how you reconcile that with a party of women's rights. Well, when you're talking about a what I would consider a red herring, less than one percent of the American population identifies sure, as just transgender. Just reconcile the this two. This is not a this is not a major issue. This was something that they utilized to try to pull out a, not a red I, I would herring. Say a dark par part of their base. The bigger issue was the economy, and quite no, frankly, I, I'd like you to answer that point if you could. So this is the bit that really irritates me when someone is asked a question that they can't really answer because there is no real answer to it. The direct question is, how do you reconcile a party that is supposed to be protecting women's rights and at the same time there is this argument which in effect is argued by many women to be eroding women's rights. But because they can't answer the question, they go around in circles to say that this is just an ongoing argument and uh, in fact avoiding the question. But uh, let's listen to the remainder. But I, I just did. It's less than 1% of the American population. I'm not asking you how many people it affects. I'm not asking you how many people Or people who went to vote. This was not their top issue. No, no one would tell you. No one is suggesting it is. The so, in fact, I think that's wrong. She says here that that's not their top issue. However, um, it is quite an important issue, not just in the United States, but around the world. Um, first of all, we've got our Supreme Court um, this month uh, going to decide on a case which... It's not going to be the definitive end word on everything to do with women's rights and uh, transgender identification and so on, but it will have a significant impact on whether or not biological sex is definitive uh, within the Equality Act and the Gender Recognition Act. Uh, more about that in another video, which I'll link below. But also, um, over in Australia, Sal Grover uh, going to court over and is now appealing this decision um, and is in conversation here because some people don't understand uh, the effect that this has when these cases are actually taken to court. Um, so I'll link this below as well. But um, from theconversation.com, they say that, in fact, this is a significant issue for voters in the United States. A March survey uh, by an independent pollster said that 68% of voters will take LGBTQ rights into consideration at the polls. Um, fully 30% stated that they would only vote for a candidate who shares their views on the issue. And so they rightly say it's no coincidence then that the rights issues feature prominently in the party platforms and they will take those into account. Um, but coming back to what Piers Morgan said here, this very much is one of those situations where a lot of people may have voted not necessarily for the party they want, but to prevent the party they don't want getting into power. Um, and that's, that may be the case for a number of people, not everybody, but a lot of people may have voted that way just so that they don't get a result that they feel they don't agree with. And we'll come back to that point when we talk about the UK in just a moment, but let's listen to the remainder of this. Transgender issues were the top thing no that they No one is about. suggesting it is. How do you reconcile the two as a Democrat? I think that the thing that Democrats need to reconcile 
is um, how to maintain working class voters because we used You'll to be the party of the working the class. Question. No, I answered the question already. It's less than 1% of the population. I didn't ask you how not many a talking affected. point for the Democratic Party because it's not a talking point for voters. Right. It is, is it a red you, you can't. So her answer there is twofold. One, she says it's not a talking point for voters, which the polls suggest is, is false um, and incorrect. Secondly, she says that her answer is that it's only less than 1% of the population uh, that, that discuss this issue, which again, um, regardless of what the statistics are, that's not answering the question. But again, let's listen to the response. Right. It, no, it's is. Because it is a red herring and I don't engage in conversations about things that are red herrings. Okay. Primarily. So describing that as a red herring, which it is not. Um, and so this is a very serious issue. So a lot of people may have voted on that. Whatever your views are about the parties themselves or the individuals themselves within those parties running for election, if you fundamentally disagree with those, uh, the people in the parties or the party in general on a particular view, that is very likely to sway your view against a party because you simply don't want that party or that person in power because they disagree with you on a, a very specific issue. Now, I think that this is exactly what happened in the UK election, because let's not forget that uh, we only had a turnout of 60% of the population. So that translates to 40% of the population either did not know who they wanted to vote for, or they just simply didn't bother. Because um, this is of the voter population, of course. So it's the turnout for um, the, the election in 2024. Only 60% actually um, turned out to vote. Now, again, as I say, that means either they didn't know who to vote for or they took a conscious choice not to vote for anybody. But when that translates into the election results themselves, this, the situation that we're in at the moment is, and this is an objective conversation here. These are facts, whether people like them or not. I mean, people make all sorts of accusations. I say accusations, they say it as though it's a criticism against me. They call me left wing, they call me right wing, they call me far left, far right, centralist, whatever. I get everything. But when I tell you these things and I break them down objectively, there is only really one way to look at it. And that is factual. These things are factual. People do take these things into account. And when we take into account the fact that only 60% of the voting population turned out to cast their vote in the UK in 2024, th that then breaks down into these parties. Now, I firmly believe because of the shift from Conservative to Labour, a lot of people that voted Labour possibly, quite likely, only voted Labour because they did not want Conservative, because they, they'd lost faith in Conservative, they didn't want to vote for anybody else, and therefore the only real alternative to them was Labour. And so, in fact, when we look down at the statistics here, the share of the votes for Labour was under 34%, which is around 20% of the overall population. So, in fact, only about 20% of the overall population in the UK wanted Labour as their government in power. Um, and many of whom may now have changed their mind now that they've seen uh, lots and lots of examples of where they have switched and changed what they've promised ahead of time. They've promised not to raise taxes. They promised not to raise national insurance. There's a big emphasis on whether it's just the employee rather than the employer. But all the reports and all the analysis suggest it's going to affect workers and employees regardless of where that increase is applied. There's arguments as to who is considered to be a worker. And the interviews and the responses in those interviews suggest that it is not somebody that owns a business or owns a property or owns shares. Keir Starmer said, and I quote, that is not someone I have in my mind as, as a working person. Well, guess what? A lot of people do consider themselves working people and they do have another house because they're trying to save for their retirement. They're trying to invest to protect their retirement and so on. They're trying to improve their situation. They're trying to in increase their personal wealth. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that at all. If you want some tips on in increasing your personal wealth, check out my other channel, Daniel Shensmith. I'll link that in the description below. There is nothing wrong with talking about personal wealth and increasing your personal wealth. But this conversation makes it sound like there's something wrong with owning a property or owning shares or growing your wealth or being a landlord. So much criticism I had when I did a video about being a landlord. 
Well, I wasn't born a landlord. I worked very hard. And yes, everybody works hard, but I worked very hard. I got qualifications. I earned money. I built businesses. And then, yes, I became a landlord. There is nothing wrong with being a landlord if you're trying to improve your personal wealth. But that seems to be um, under attack by Labour because they are decimating the landlord market. And so lots of landlords I personally know are selling up their properties because it is very difficult to run that business. And with Keir Starmer saying that he doesn't consider somebody a working person if they own a property or they own shares and things like that, that might not be precisely what he meant, but that's how it came across. And so that's what people will infer. And so when you think of all those things together, and then you think about Coming back to the issue on uh, women's rights, and particularly in sports, I mean, I note that uh, this particular one here was quoted by Sharon Davis, who's very vocal on uh, women's rights and protection in sports. And we have the whole situation with Imani Khalif, with now um, reportedly and allegedly a leaked document to say that um, Imani Khalif is male and not female. So that whole situation there with medals that Imani Khalif won and lots of people are now saying shouldn't have won and they were wrong and these sports organisations are on the wrong side. So when you then look at the political parties and which way they lean on these issues, that is absolutely key to how people vote. So coming back to the presidential election outcome, this, in my view, is a very strong indicator as to why so many people have voted a certain way. Of course, there are diehard Trump supporters and there are those that absolutely probably can't stand him. And I'm sure Donald Trump knows that. And I think a lot of those people may even have voted for Donald Trump, even though they didn't like Donald Trump in the first place or many years ago may have absolutely uh, stood against Donald Trump being president and may have even vocally been against Donald Trump back then. Uh, and obviously, in, in the case of speaking against Donald Trump, we have our own Foreign Secretary, David Lammy, whose posts are still live, by the way. And um, David Atherton noted that he hasn't found the delete button yet and uh, gone back to delete those tweets. Um, but there we go. They are still live, those criticisms of Donald Trump. Maybe he's changed his view now. I mean, he gritted his teeth and said congratulations, but uh, that's that's all we've seen so far. But now there is this increased pressure between the US and the UK because I just can't see Donald Trump getting along with David Lammy having made those previous conversations. Um, as it's been noted, Donald Trump has a long memory for those things. But because of everything I've said, there will, of course, be substantial support for Donald Trump across the US and probably around the world because of these positions on things like women's rights, things like immigration and border control and so on and so forth. But I do find it extremely interesting that never before have I seen such a polarizing set of issues that separate parties and supporters of those parties because it seems to me that if you agree with any one of these issues that are anything other than the far left, suddenly you're labelled far right. Even if many of those people actually consider themselves something of a centrist, something of uh, someone who sees both sides of an argument, sees certain things on the left as being good and certain things on the right as being good and would never think of themselves as right wing, certainly not far right, but are labelled so because they don't agree with the far left ideologies. I've been in that camp myself because I've aired something of a view occasionally. I don't usually do that, but every now and again, I've hinted a view here and there. And because that view is perhaps not a far left view, I'm then labeled far right. But vice versa, if I say something that is somewhat central or left, then suddenly I'm called a lefty or even a centrist. So I think labeling people is the wrong thing to do. But I think when people are casting their vote, they are not just voting for who they want in, in power or which party they want in power, but they are, in my opinion, very much voting on their views and what they see the party in power is going to do and what steps they're going to take in support of their views. And so I found that very interesting. I hope that gives you some enlightenment as to I, what I think is really going on here. Please do like the video and subscribe and share my video with somebody that helps my channel grow. And as always, thank you for watching.